morning again, everyone. You're very welcome to the Shadow Christian Fellowship. Welcome to those who are watching in on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, they would have been wondering this morning, the Sunday come would have been wondering, is knowing the new ventriloquist preacher? Because I forgot to turn the camera around, so it was focused here. So the only said, how come I can see myself? Thankfully, we haven't gone live. Before we, before we look at God's word, I just want to pray uh, and ask for God's blessing on it. But also just to let you know that the little child that we were praying for last week, Amelia Rose, has come through her operation. Oh, yeah. And so, we're delighted, we're delighted about that. And I'm sure Johnny and, and, and Brenda are delighted too. But I just want to give thanks to the Lord for it. Yeah, and, uh, and then commit this time to him and his word. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning, thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate your goodness again here today. Good news, Lord, that Leah Amelia has come through this operation, Father, and we just pray that she would continue to make a full and speedy recovery, Lord, and that she would be strong and be able, Lord God, to get about her business, Father, please. Lord, we ask your blessing upon her. We ask your blessing upon her wee brother and upon Lord uh, Johnny and Brenda, Lord, and ask that you would touch their lives through this, Lord God, that you would just remind them of your goodness toward them, please, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning, you know, Lord, as we say often here, we're sitting here in this hall, maybe people who are tuned in this morning and different parts of the world watching, Lord, and they've got their own burdens, they've got their own anxieties, they've got their own troubles, Lord God, that they're carrying, and we just pray, Almighty God, please, this morning, that you would draw alongside people, and that you would uphold them in your everlasting arms, that you would bear them up, O God, in your strength, and that you would whisper your words of comfort and love into their hearts, Lord, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're not a God who is remote and distant. You're a God who is near. Mm-hmm. And we just pray, Lord, please, that you would draw near to those who are struggling, those who are finding life difficult at this time. Those, Lord, like the man last week that I talked about who said if it wasn't for his fear of hell, he would commit suicide. I wonder, Lord, how many other people feel like that, feel that they have no purpose in life. Lord, we know the one who gives purpose. We know the one who gives meaning. Oh, it's Jesus. And we pray, Lord, please, that by your Spirit, mm-hmm. you would point people to Jesus today. Yes. And that Jesus would be exalted and magnified. Mm-hmm. And in him, Lord God, you would be glorified, please. Mm-hmm. Father, speak to us now through your word. Help us, Lord, to take what you're saying to us, Lord God, and, and, and check it out ourselves in the Scriptures to see if what is said is true. That's just to take my word for it, Lord. To search the scriptures and to be sure ourselves, Lord God, of what is being said. Mm-hmm. For your word is truth, and your truth sets people free. Mm-hmm. And we want people to be set free by that truth today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The conscious punishment in hell of those who die in penitent. When you think about that, when you just think of that statement, and it's in our statement of faith for this reason. The conscious punishment in hell of those who die in penitence is a doctrine not well liked in various churches and among many Christians and unbelievers but nonetheless it is something that we cannot ignore. It is a subject that we cannot ignore. In fact we will ignore it at our peril. And I was speaking to someone during the week who was talking to a loved one about you know hearing sermons on hell and you know, they, they weren't happy about hearing. Why would you go to church that speaks about hell? Uh, but the reality is, we've got to speak about it because it's in the Word of God. And we've got to tell people about it. And there are those who find it offensive. They find it offensive because they're afraid. They find it offensive because they think a God of love would never send anybody to hell. And they're right. God of love would never send anyone to hell. Um, but the reality is, we can't ignore the truth of God's Word. Jesus spoke about hell. Not to instill fear in his listeners, because we've already noticed and made clear that the fear of hell doesn't save anyone. Being afraid of hell isn't going to save you from hell. It's only through faith in Jesus that a person is saved from hell. So Jesus spoke to his listeners, not to instill fear, but he spoke to help people understand that there is a new world to come. Death is not the end. There is a new world to come for which everyone needs to prepare. Because not only is there a heaven, just to say over here all the time, people say there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned, 
I think was the term that the brother used to use. Not only is there a heaven, but there is a final place of punishment for those who die impenitent in an unforgiven, sinful state, for those who die without Jesus in their lives. And so let me be very, very clear, and I have been, as I said, many times to many, many funerals and have conducted many, many funerals. And I have never, never been to a funeral in nearly 40 years of walking with the Lord. I have never been to a funeral where I've heard of the person gone to hell. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen. Everybody has gone to a better place. Their suffering's over. The one that winds me up most of all is they've gained their angel wings. Mm -hmm. That really irks me. <laughs> but let me just be clear. And I know people don't like it, but we need to be absolutely clear about this. No matter, no matter what people may think, not everyone is going to heaven. Please be clear about that. No matter what people may tell you, no matter what nonsense you believe about being confirmed as a baby in some church or other, being baptized as a baby in some church or other, no matter how much money you give into a church, no matter how much good works you might do in this world to make the difference in so many other people's lives, not everyone is going to heaven. However, as we've heard so far, Hades is not hell. Sheol is not hell. And neither is Gehenna, the one that Jesus used, the burning, stinking dump that Jesus used as an example of hell. Gehenna is not hell. These three are basically the same place considered to be the temporary abode of those who die unprepared, impenitent, unrepentant, or as I said, who die without Jesus. Now, you'll notice there's nothing said there about the unbeliever because we've been driving it home, uh, about the believer, sorry, we've been driving it home that the Bible is absolutely clear for the believer. You are absent from the body, present with the Lord. This is speaking to the unbeliever. These three places, this Hades, Sheol, and Gehenna. These three places are basically the same place considered to be the temporary abode. So when the unbeliever pops their clogs, they will go to a place of this nature, and they will temporarily abide there until the day of judgment. And having looked at these three, I think most of us will agree who were here over the past number of weeks, that we will agree there is nothing good to be said about any of them. This temporary abode, which is described in such terms as burning flames, great anguish, and torment, this abode of the unbeliever once they die, the temporary abode, is still not hell. Now, they are horrific in on their own, and yet they are still not hell. Well, it, was, it was the evangelist Billy Sunday who said these words. If there was more hell preached in our churches, there would be less hell on our streets. Isn't that an interesting one? If there was more hell preached in our churches, there would be less hell on our streets. And I wonder this morning, is he right? If there was more hell, for example, preached in our universities and schools, but the universities and schools have removed God. They don't want God in the universities and the schools. But if there was more hell preached in our universities and schools, would there be less hell in our country? If there was more hell preached in our workplaces and in our homes, would there be less hell in our communities? You know, last Sunday, uh, Ricky Malone gave a wonderful testimony uh, to God's grace in his life. It was a fantastic testimony. But, nothing against Ricky, but... When he mentioned attending an Alpha course, I sat at the back and cringed. Because I wouldn't touch it with John Hume's 40 foot parts boat. I wouldn't endorse or support the Alpha course under any circumstances. Now that doesn't, let me be very clear, that doesn't mean God cannot use them. And no doubt he has. But when I first read about the Alpha, I think it was in late 80s or early 90s, I really wasn't impressed at all because the material suggested that the leaders shouldn't talk about sin 
And they most certainly shouldn't mention hell because it might put people off. <laughs> How incredible was that? How can any Christian share the gospel of Jesus without speaking about sin and hell? And whether now the Alpha Course, could people still come to me and say, to me, oh, you know, you should do an Alpha Course and share over my dead body? <laughs> <laughs> when the Alpha, whether it has changed or not, when the first came out, it was, it was wrong. And if it has changed, well, that's okay, but I still just cannot find myself supporting or endorsing it. J.I. Packer, the evangelical theologian, said, if Christians neglect to preach God's judgment against sin, which is death and hell, if Christians neglect to preach God's judgment against sin, we can't present Jesus as the saviour from sin and from the wrath of God. And how true that is. In other words, if we don't warn people about sin and hell, then they won't know that they need Jesus to save them from it. And let me put this this way, and please excuse the pun. If you belong to a church, or if you attend a church that doesn't preach hell, then get the hell out of it. Because that's the reality of what you're facing. You are facing not the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you cannot preach the good news of Jesus coming into the world to save sinners, if the sinners have got nothing to be saved from. If your church doesn't preach on hell, then get the hell out of it. Christian ministers, pastors and preachers who only want to tell people about the love of God but neglect to warn of God's wrath against sin, failing to warn about hell, they are guilty of diminishing or denying God's justice and His holiness which cannot tolerate sin. And you can't, like the Belfast Agreement, cherry pick the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's more frightening today is that there is certain teaching, certain teaching in the church which diminishes the reality of the conscious punishment in hell of those who die in paradise. And that is why it is in our statement of faith. And there's copies of our statement of faith for anybody who wants them. They're at the back. You can feel free to take one. There is a teaching in the church today diminishing the reality of the conscious punishment in hell. Of those who die in heaven. Turn please to Psalm 37. Psalm of David. I'm just going to pick out a few verses here. Not cherry picking, but you'll understand uh, why I've got these. Psalm 37, verse 9. For evildoers will be cut off. Please hear this this morning. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. You know, I used to go those Christians who thought we were floating for eternity on a cloud playing a harp. I used to say to God, I really couldn't be bothered about that. You know, and the other nonsense where we were sitting last week, you know, you better go to hell. You know, because you, you know, believe the lie that you'll be in good company. But it's not true, you'll never be in good company if you're in hell. But neither will you sit on a cloud playing a harp. So it says here, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So if you're wondering where you're going to spend eternity, you're not going to be floating up in heaven or up in some really glorious place up there. You'll be up there for a while until Jesus comes back. <laughs> and then he says, Behold, I am making all things new. So you will be living on the new earth. This is why it's there. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish Choosing these words and really emphasizing them here for a reason. So cut off and perish. But the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the metal, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. Turn now please to Malachi chapter 3. That's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, or if you're from West Belfast, it's Malachi. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3. Oh, sorry, chapter 4. We're reading from chapter 4. 
And verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and go fat like stall-fed cows. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. And our last reading is in Second Peter, and we're reading from chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 5. Peter writes, he's speaking here to scoffers, he's speaking to people who in the last days, people even today who have said, ah, for goodness sake, Ty, you've been going on about Jesus coming back since 1984. Uh, and I'm still going on about Jesus coming back, but these are scoffers, mockers, people who say, ah, where is this Jesus who you keep telling us coming back? Oh, you're in flame and nonsense. And so he says this, but this, the he's talking about the scoffers, for this they willfully forget. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition or destruction of the ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise of some kind of slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. There are real words of encouragement this morning. Listen to this. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than the doctrine of hell, if it lay in my power. But it has the support of Scripture, and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by the Christian church, and has the support of the reason. These are the words of C.S. Lewis. In Psalm 37, we read that all evildoers will be cut off. The word here is destroyed. They shall be no more. Do you understand? They shall be no more. They shall perish into smoke. They shall just vanish away. And one of the terms for cutting off, which is why I emphasize this cut off, one of the terms... Uh, to best describe what David is saying in this psalm is they will cease to be. They will cease to be. And for the word perish that he uses is the word annihilate. They shall be annihilated. Now, in Malachi chapter 4, he tells us that the wicked shall be like stubble, burned up as ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. Now, increasing numbers of people believe that 2 Peter 3 suggests that when the day of the Lord occurs, as it will, that the destruction by fire which melts the elements with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it being burned up, that it includes, please listen, many believe that it includes the judgment of Satan, his demons, and all unbelievers who shall be consumed by fire in a moment. Fire that nothing or nothing whatsoever will be left. Such will be the ferocity of the fire. Such will be uh, how ferocious 
it will spread in that moment. Nothing will be left. And the fire will eventually burn out. Now, when you think about a fire, it needs, you know, it needs fuel, it needs oxygen. It needs to be kept going. And if you don't keep the fire going, then the fire will burn out. Now, this teaching is called annihilationism or extinctionism. And it doesn't support the teaching of an eternal hell for those who die without Jesus as their Savior. And this teaching is rife in the church today. It rejects the conscious punishment in hell of those who die in penitent. And like many Christians, I have to put my hands up and say this, like many Christians, I would love this to be true. I would love to be able to speak about annihilationism, preferring to see the wicked dead snuffed out forever. I want you to think about this this morning. God forbid that all the more reason to pray for your loved ones. But imagine if a loved one dies without Christ. What would you prefer? That they were just snuffed out forever as if they didn't exist? Or that they would be in a place of eternal torment? And so the church is embracing this false lying doctrine because it can't stand up to the truth of God's word. It will not take a stand upon the truth of God's word. And it will still perpetuate this lie that a God of love will never send anyone to hell. But the reality is that although that is a lie that's presented to avoid speaking about hell, God doesn't send anyone to hell. I would love annihilationism or extinctionism to be true. I would prefer to see the wicked dead snuffed out forever rather than knowing they shall be cast into hell and tormented forever. And no doubt, the unbeliever and the unprepared, they would prefer annihilationism over hell. But it makes it easier to live with because they can do as they please. They can live as they like because in the end it won't matter. We will just be extinguished. We will be made extinct. It will be as if I have never existed rather than being cast from God's presence into an eternal hell. Annihilationism sounds so much better. In fact, it even allows us Christians off the hook as far as speaking about a loving God who sends people to hell. But as I said last week, I'm driving home for a reason. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He just simply honors their lifelong choice. He gives them what they desire. Anyone who goes to hell, anyone who finds themselves in hell, it's their choice, not God's. So don't be blaming God for something that God hasn't done. Christians have a tendency to blame Satan for things Satan hasn't done. And unbelievers have a tendency to blame God for things God hasn't done. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they are strong advocates of annihilationism. As do some well-known Bible teachers and theologians advocate this as well. Like, for example, the late John Stock. He believed in this teaching, as does the theologian and author Gregory Boyd. In fact, Gregory Boyd says this, Scripture's references to an unquenchable fire and an undying worm also refer to the finality of judgment not duration. The fire is unquenchable in the sense that one cannot hope to put it out before it consumes those who are thrown into it. That's one of the modern day theologians. And he has written some very, very good books. I'm not a fan, but I know some people that are. But hear that again. Scripture's references, this is how he justifies annihilationism. Scripture's references to an unquenchable fire and an undying worm also refer to the finality of judgment, not its duration. The fire is unquenchable in the sense that one cannot hope to put it out before it consumes those who are thrown into it. More Christian denominations, even in this time, more Christians, Christian denominations believe in the, the doctrine of conditional immortality. It's another classic. Conditional immortality, which says those who are sent to hell, you couldn't make this up, right? 
It says those who are sent to hell won't experience eternal conscious punishment, but a time-limited conscious punishment, after which they shall be annihilated. Now this is, they're buying into this because they don't want to tell people about hell. So what they're actually saying is, is well, here's the way it's going to happen. If you die without Christ, you're going into this torment and this hell, this fire or whatever, for a limited period only. Do you remember I was doing the, the, the series on uh, limited offers? About some of these <laughs> time limited offers. Oh, here is a time limited conscious punishment. God's going to throw you in there for a wee while, and then He's just decided He's going to annihilate you. So you're going to be suffering for whatever period of time, and then somehow you're just going to be snuffed out. Annihilationism suggests that a human soul is not immortal unless. It is given eternal life. So basically what it's saying is, is when you were a non-believer, you didn't have a soul. But when you became a Christian, a born-again Christian, you received the soul. This is what annihilationism believes. And therefore, because they believe that, unbelievers can be completely destroyed by fire. It's not what the Bible teaches. Orthodox Judaism, it's better. Orthodox Judaism believes in a probationary period, much like the Roman Catholic Church's um, teaching on purgatory. But theirs is only for members of the House of Israel. How class is that? Theirs is only for members of the House of Israel, but it gets better. They have told God, you can put it into that place, but they're no longer than 11 months. I'm <laughs> going And that's what they believe. That they can only go to this place for 11 months. Unbelievable. I thank God for Messianic Jews because the Messianic Jewish theologian, the late David H. Stern, he said these words changing the biblical teaching of hell as a place of eternal conscious punishment to annihilationism or non existence is wishful thinking. And that's what it is. Hear it again? Changing the biblical teaching of hell, look, we would all love to change it because we don't like it. Like a Belfast agreement, I would love to change it because I don't like it. Most of unionism going to the elections this week would probably say, yeah, I would love to change it but because I don't like it. But the fact is, it's not in our power anymore to do so. Changing the biblical teaching of hell as a place of eternal conscious punishment to annihilation to non-existence is wishful thinking. And of course, of course the wishful thinker in all of us, or among us, of course we would prefer annihilationism rather than the conscious punishment in hell of those who die in heaven. But again, as C.S. Lewis says, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than the doctrine of hell, if it lay in my but it doesn't. He goes on. But it has the support of Scripture. It is there in Scripture. And especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by the Christian church. And it has the support of the reason. God is a God of justice. He is a judge, the judge of all the earth. And he will do what is right. That is the truth of God's word. And although we don't like the thought of it, and although we would much prefer to ignore it or change it, the Bible teaching of hell as an eternal place of conscious punishment, nonetheless, it is not in our power to remove it. So Christian, Please understand that you have a responsibility when you're sharing the gospel with people to tell them the truth of God's word. It is not in our power to remove the teaching of hell. Hell is real. And people need to understand that death is not the end. There is a new world to come for which everyone needs to prepare. And thanks be to Jesus. Thanks be to Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us that there is a heaven.
There is that temporary dwelling place for those who die in Christ because we know we're going to inherit the earth. But thanks be to Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. There is that place, heaven, and there is an eternal home for those prepared for eternity, for those who do what God's word says. And it's simple. Who confess their sin. That is agree with God. When God says that you are a sinner, then you must agree with God because God doesn't tell lies. And when he says you are a sinner, you agree with him. That's what confess your sin means. Confess, yes, Lord, you're right. I am a sinner. And then he says we are to turn around and turn away from our sinful ways and our sinful life and put our trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. We have to understand that just as there is a heaven and a new earth that we will inherit, there is a final place of punishment for those who die in penitent in an unforgiven sinful state. Christian, we must never shy away from the truth of God's word. We must never be afraid or ashamed to tell people what it is. The thought of hell is horrific. Why do you think God sent his son Jesus into the world? Why do you think the love of God for us compels him to send his son into the world to die for us? Because hell is horrific. And he sent Jesus into the world to save sinners. The good news is no one may find themselves in hell if they simply look to Jesus for salvation and accept him as their Lord and Savior. And so for the Christian, we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We know that because of Jesus, we will never see hell because we are in Christ. But we have that good news that we need to share with others so that they too may know Jesus as their Lord and Savior so that they too may never know hell. Maybe this morning there's someone here or someone watching in Facebook and you're not yet a born again Christian, you're not yet saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus. Well, I need to tell you in all honesty, if it were in my power to remove the teachings of hell, I would do so. If it were in my power to take it out of the Bible, I would do so. But it's not in my power. The Bible is the word of God. I can't add to it. I can't take from it. And therefore, it remains. Hell remains a present reality should you die in an unprepared state for eternity. And therefore this morning I urge you please to confess your sins, to repent and to trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to save you. There is no opportunity for repentance or for salvation after death. Behold now is the acceptable time. Behold now is the day of salvation. Don't leave it too late. That's right. Lord, I know that we're dealing with this sensitive subject that is hell. And although we may not be able to get our head around it because of how horrific it is, and although it presents many difficult questions for us, Father, Nonetheless, Lord God, thank you that you have dealt with it in the provision of Jesus Christ, your Son. That no one may be in hell because of Jesus. Because he came into this world to save sinners, those who confess their sin, repent, and put their trust in him, will never know hell. Because we have that full and wonderful salvation that is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And I pray, Father, this morning for us Christians 
that you would forgive us when we avoid some of the, the difficult subjects and difficult doctrine and difficult topics, Lord, of your word. And we shy away because we don't want to offend or we don't want to be offended by people abusing us when we tell the truth. Forgive us, Lord, please, when we don't take a true stand upon the truth of your word. And may you please give us the strength to do so because, Lord, as these days get darker and darker they will get, we need to be a people who stand true to the word of God, that your word is our sure and firm foundation and that we wouldn't shy away from it and that we wouldn't be afraid to proclaim it. Help us, Lord, please, not to pollute, to dilute or to compromise your truth but to speak it and proclaim it, to live it, and to demonstrate it to the people that you lead us to, that they too might know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, and in him find salvation. And Lord, I pray this morning for anyone who's not yet a Christian, and I ask you please, Almighty God, that you would help them to understand that hell is a present reality for them if they remain in their unforgiven state. Lord, you're extending your arms to them this morning, reaching out to them in your love, wanting to rescue them. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would draw them to yourself, that they too might be saved and the scapegoat of the hell that is to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.